All right, Rebel EM YouTube subscribers. So new paper, intubation in surgical patients, video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy. I am Salim Razai. And before we get into this, I just wanted to let you guys know about an opportunity, which is if you've enjoyed the free version of YouTube with your subscription, consider the opportunity of becoming a member. You get more perks and in getting those perks, you also can support all things Rebel EM for less than a cup of coffee a month. Essentially, there are three tiers, silver, gold, and platinum. Silver is 99 cents a month, gets you loyalty badges, priority replies to comments and questions, and members only polls. Gold gets you everything that silver gets you, but it gets you early access to new videos and exclusive members only videos. I've been working a ton in the cadaver lab, have tons of procedural videos there and plan on putting a lot more $1.99 a month. And then platinum gets you everything silver and gold gets you, except now you also get live streams, which I've started doing a few of these on clinical conundrums and difficult cases. And that costs $2.99 a month. So enough with that, let's get on with the paper. So I asked you a poll question. When intubating a critically ill adult patient, what is your go-to laryngoscope style? And I gave you guys four options, and by far and away, video laryngoscopy was the most common choice in almost 90% of the 32 people who voted. Standard geometry video laryngoscopy was the most common in two-thirds of the answers, and that is my go-to device as well. There are some patients, though, where I will consider hyperangulated geometry, maybe a trauma patient where I have limited cervical movement. And then standard geometry direct laryngoscopy is kind of one of my backup plans. And then other, nobody voted for other. So it was 0% for that. So let's start with a little bit of background. I've already done a video on the device trial. And in that trial, it was published in New England Journal of Medicine, August of 2023. And they looked at standard geometry video laryngoscopy versus standard geometry direct laryngoscopy for tracheal intubation in critically ill adults. And to summarize that video, it was a randomized clinical trial in 17 emergency departments and ICUs with 1,400 critically ill adults, standard geometry video laryngoscopy versus uh, standard geometry direct laryngoscopy. Now, greater than 90% of the intubations were performed by residents and fellows, and their primary outcome was first attempt intubation success. And by far and away, video laryngoscopy did better than direct laryngoscopy. Now, as the experience of the operator improved or increased, this difference also started to decrease, but still trended toward video laryngoscopy doing better. So what paper are we talking about today? Well, hot off the press, published in JAMA, March 2024, video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy for endotracheal intubation in the operating room. The clinical question these authors were trying to answer was, does video laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy decrease the number of intubation attempts in patients undergoing surgical procedures in an operating room setting requiring intubation? Here's what they did. A single center randomized clinical trial with two sets of 11 operating rooms. These operating rooms were randomized every week to either hyperangulated video laryngoscopy or standard geometry direct laryngoscopy. Their outcomes of note, the primary outcome, which is what the study was powered for, was number of intubation attempts. The secondary outcome of note was intubation failure, which they defined as switching devices or greater than three intubation attempts. Now, the population that was included was over 8,400 surgical procedures and over 7,700 patients. By far and away, most of these intubations were elective procedures, so not critically ill patients, 85% of them as a matter of fact, which meant only 15% of the intubations were emergent type intubations. Who did the intubations in this study? About 39% were nurse anesthetists, 30% were residents, 14% were fellows. Now of note, less than 3% of the intubations were done by staff anesthesiologists. So this is really looking at intubation in a set of trainees, which is very similar to what the device trial did. The key results, greater than one intubation attempt, VL did better than DL, 1.7% versus 7.6%. Intubation failure, 
Again, VL did better than DL, 0.27% versus 4%. And there was no difference in any airway or dental injuries, approximately 1% in both groups. So a few discussion points that I think are worth bringing up here. So the first is in terms of the rapid sequence intubation medications that were used. There was some combination of the medications I have listed on this slide. Now, it's unknown what doses, what frequencies, and what combinations of those rapid sequence intubation meds were given. Now, I wanted to just mention a couple things here. So first of all, my induction agent of choice is typically ketamine, one to two milligrams per kilogram. I am not typically using propofol, etomidate, or fentanyl like they did in this study. The other thing I want to point out is their rocuronium dosing, which is my paralytic of choice, was one milligram per kilogram in this study. Maybe for non-critically ill, non-shocky patients, this is appropriate, but in the type of patients that I'm intubating, I want to dose my paralytics much higher to get that rapid onset of paralysis, and so I'm typically using 1.5 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. Now, this was interesting because it was hyperangulated video laryngoscopy versus standard geometry direct laryngoscopy. And we already have a study that was published on this by Brian Driver in Annals of Emergency Medicine back in 2020. This was an observational trial comparing standard geometry versus hyperangulated geometry. Now, both groups had a mix of video and direct, but in terms of first attempt success, there was no difference between groups, 91.9% .9 for standard geometry, 89.2% for hyperangulated geometry. The last thing I'm going to say about this paper is we have very little information in terms of operator experience. And I think we can all agree a medical student doing an intubation versus a first or third year resident compared to a fellow compared to an attending is going to be vastly different. And the failure rate by level of experience would have been really nice to have in this study. But luckily, we already got that information in the device trial. So I think it's a moot point for this study. What's the bottom line of this trial? A hyperangulated video laryngoscope approach decreased the number of attempts needed for successful intubation compared to direct laryngoscopy. We now have two randomized clinical trials. Both are saying the same thing. Video laryngoscopy should be our go-to approach in intubating patients, especially in trainees. Now, whether you use standard geometry or hyperangulated geometry, I think will be clinician decision and also the patient in front of you in terms of what they have going on. So there you have it. Intubation in surgical patients, video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy, hot off the press. Let me know your thoughts, comments, and questions. And don't forget... If you enjoy videos like this, consider becoming a member of the Rebel EM YouTube page. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.